Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The most difficult part of following the Bible is accepting the factuality of our powerlessness. Human beings repeatedly invent ways to sustain the illusion of control and self-importance, scheming tirelessly to defend and secure the passing fallacy of our place in the world. According to, more accurately, as evidenced by the written Gospel of Matthew, Scripture is written, and what is written in Scripture controls everything because it is factually correct and deals with the factuality of the world around us. Matthew's account of the Nativity amplifies this point through the sign of Mary's weakness, which highlights the sign of Joseph's absence and ultimately the helplessness and vulnerability of the child, Jesus Christ. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 232 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We emphasized earlier in Matthew the very important point that Jesus was produced by the divine seed of his father and that he belonged neither to Joseph or David nor to Mary. We argued from the terminology in the Greek. We talked about different manuscripts that Jesus belongs to no one. But at the same time, in the genealogy here in Matthew and in chapter 2 of Matthew, women have a specific function. And their function is to undermine the patrilineal assumption that somehow this line of kings... And it's not about male versus female. It's just a way of playing one against the other to put the emphasis where it belongs, which is on the seed of the father. In this sense, Mary is a disruptor. So when it talks about her being the mother of Jesus, it is emphasizing the same point that was made in chapter one, when we were not allowed to think of Jesus as being her son from her. Jesus is not from Mary. Jesus is not from Joseph. Jesus is not from David. Jesus is from God through the line of the promise. The reason why Mary appears in this passage is to emphasize the absence of a father. Normally, if you are going to hand power over from father to son, the father's got to be there. Joseph is neglected, but Mary is there. This is strange. Even if you have the inauguration of a president of the United States, the old president shows up to hand over power peaceably. And in a monarchical society, it goes from father to son. So if you're going to treat him like a king, you have to show respect to his father. But Joseph is not around. So Mary's presence undermines the idea of any kind of human father for Jesus. It's simply that she is disrupting the normal scheme of things when you're going from father to son in a monarchical genealogy. As a feminist, you have to hear it as though when David is disrupted, I, even I as a woman, am being disrupted because the issue ultimately is not gender. The issue is human authority. And that's why you can't play the game of using Mary's motherhood as a mechanism of power. Then you're not hearing Matthew. It's very difficult for all of us as modern listeners not to fall in the trap of saying, see, David's not a father, but Mary's a mother. That's not what the text is saying. No, then the text has to go and undermine matrilineal authority and do the same thing because it's about disrupting human authority. Whatever you try to set up, the text has to undermine. It's something that we're constantly reminded of when we work with Father Paul on the Tuesday show. 
it's very difficult not to bring your ideas to the text. The only way we can get around it is to really make the effort to hear what the text is saying. Nowhere is Matthew dealing with gender. So why do we bring gender into it? Gender's in the story, the same way that there are healings and miracles, the same way that there's disobedience, the same way that there's suffering, but that doesn't mean scripture's talking about suffering. It doesn't mean it's talking about gender. These are just part of the story, and the story is telling you what the story wants to say, and that's our task here. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Herod is again obsessing over the specifics of the palace intrigue, if you will. It's very much like a person at your company obsessing and hanging on every word that an executive said and trying to figure out the politics and how it affects your job and what's going to happen. It's the same old game. People have been playing it for centuries. It's the Game of Thrones. Herod does what a lot of people do with scripture. He listens to it, then he evaluates it, and then he decides what he's going to do about it. He calls in the chief priests and the scribes, and they tell him what scripture says. And he says, hmm, interesting idea. Bethlehem, let's find out more. He doesn't say, oh, well, I guess I'm done here because a new king is coming from Bethlehem. No, he says, oh, there's going to be a new king from Bethlehem. Let's see what I can do to disrupt how this plays out. He tries to listen to the text, but rather than listen to the text to submit to the text, he listens to the text in order to manipulate the text to say what he wants to say. He wants to then figure out how he can undermine the scripture's declaration that the king is coming from Bethlehem. And he says, but I'm the king, so let me figure out how I'm going to work this. Just like most human beings just want to manipulate the text, Herod wants to figure out how he can get it to work to his advantage. It's the Game of Thrones. The king is just an extreme expression of what every human being is. At the end of the day, if you understand that scripture is anti-kingly, and then you realize that the king is just the ultimate expression of what you aspire to, then you realize that Herod is doing what every king does, but as you said, Richard, it's also what every human being does, scheme and plot to ensure their own success. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. He sounds exactly like a politician on cable news. Pick your station, who has a strategy to achieve a specific end, and then puts lipstick all over it to make it look nice. It's the same game. He's propagandizing. Obviously, he doesn't care to worship Jesus. Obviously, he's threatened by Jesus. The point is, that Matthew is telling you this is what kings do. This is typical. And everyone hearing the story who's honest knows that that's the case. They know that's the case, but few act accordingly because still human beings are looking for that king or that president or that prime minister who acts somehow in a different way than every other king that's existed in history. They still want to find that ruler who isn't going to be looking out for their own legacy, for their own survival, for their own power. The human being wants to find the king who's going to act correctly, and it's not going to happen. And that's why there is this prophecy about Bethlehem talking about this eschatological ruler who's going to act differently than all the other rulers. You can't invade Syria unless you can convince the people that you're doing it for humanitarian reasons. That is the game Herod is playing. And so you talk about the legacy of Martin Luther King, and then you beat the drum for war, which Dr. King fought against. He fought against war. He fought against violence. He fought against poverty. You can't claim that mantle and then say, no, we actually want to make war for a good reason. And at the same time, when you have no good reason in Yemen, you just simply bomb them back into the dark ages and you don't talk about it and hope no one notices. That's the Game of Thrones. Now, just because one president speaks eloquently about invading a country and another president speaks crassly about doing the same thing doesn't change anything on the ground. This is the point. You have to be scriptural through and through and understand that everything gets broken down to its function, not how you describe it or what it is in its essence, but how it operates. And then everything is laid bare. When you look at the world this way, under the control of scripture, you become wise and you're not fooled by Herod's propaganda. 
You can fall in the trap of saying Herod had good intentions or bad intentions, or maybe Herod is better than Caesar. You can't do that because at the end of the day, he's plotting to kill a baby. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. So we have this heavenly display that indicates where the king is, and this is the trope that's used in the ancient world in general. You have the heavens themselves declare so-and-so to be the king. This has been happening since the ancient Mesopotamians, who were already ancient by the time of the Romans. This is typical to show that the gods, the heavens, the cosmos are pointing to this child as the next king. They are looking to see this king, and so this is where they're headed. And like we said in the very beginning when we introduced the Magi, the Magi look to the stars to get their teaching, and God can use any mechanism he wants in order to lead his people wherever he wants, and he does it the way that he wants. There's nothing good or bad in his methods. They're only good because he uses them. There's something else important happening in verse 9, Richard, namely that you have two masters being presented. You have the king and you have the true shepherd, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Two masters, as it were. And the magi who represent the rulers of the nations hear the instruction of the ruler of Judah and choose instead to continue listening to the instruction of the father of Jesus, the true shepherd, who then brings them, as you said, to their destination on the map. Everything is still under his control and they're still obedient. And now we're going to see whether they ultimately remain faithful to his will, which led them to Jesus, or whether they follow after Herod. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And here one has to hear verse 10 as the nations rejoicing in the good news of the written word. They are rejoicing in the instruction. This is how the star functions correctly as a metaphor for the commandment itself. If you hear the star as something else, if you contextualize it in Greek philosophy, the way I hear people talk all the time, this vain talk that we critiqued in a previous episode, you miss the real point of Matthew, that the nations are following Torah. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Coming back to our comment at the outset of the episode, you have a king who does not come from a patrilineal dynasty, and his mother is there in order to prove this point. And you have the kings of the earth worshipping him, which means that the Magi are doing here in Matthew what Israel could not do in Samuel, which is worship God, their true father and king and shepherd. It's remarkable here that it doesn't just say they saw the young child and fell down and worshiped him. Why do they have to put Mary in here? What does Mary add to the scene? In your mind, it might add some soft lighting and some violins or something like that, but it's not sentimental. There's a literary function that this plays. It shows that Joseph is not relevant. Is Joseph here? We don't know if he's even here. That's the point. We know that the Magi are here. We know that the child is here. And we know that Mary is here. But we don't know about the father. The absence of the father, the would-be father, Joseph, brings to our minds God being the father because God is the one who sowed the seed in Mary so that God's son could be born. We have the fruit. We have the land. But the one that supplied the seed is only understood because of the teaching that they gave to the Magi to come here to worship. Because interestingly, the Magi, who only had stars and they did not have scripture, knew that this is where they had to go to worship. Herod, who had the chief priests and the scribes reading him scripture, said, oh, I'll, I'll get, eventually get around to it. They did not just come and worship in order to check off a box. The way that it sounds in Greek, I mean, they rejoiced, a rejoicing exceedingly, emphasizing how it was a joy for them to worship. Whereas Herod, even with the scripture, yeah, we'll see if he gets around to it at some point. This is where I love the prayer of St. Romanos, you know, the famous prayer from the Akathist. Chere nymphi animfefte. Rejoice, bride, without a bridegroom. How can you rejoice in a woman 
who has no groom. How can you rejoice in an unwed mother? You're glorying in her weakness, which magnifies the might of the seed, which produced Jesus. The seed that Jesus carries to spread. It is our disempowerment in order to amplify the might of the instruction. So you have the vulnerable child, Jesus. You have the vulnerable woman who is a bride without a bridegroom. Her groom, as it were, is the father of Jesus. But how can you quantify his power in real terms? This is how literature works. You know, just so you can see this mechanism when you're reading carefully, Mary is here to emphasize who is not here. The huge emphasis on the joy of the Magi is here to emphasize the lack of joy in Herod. Matthew goes overboard with how happy these Magi are. And it just shows how lukewarm Herod was. It's the joy of our powerlessness. You've heard me critique the culture of therapy that dominates Western societies. And it's because there's a kind of tyranny in that culture. It presumes our power. And it presumes that we can somehow do something with ourselves, which becomes, again, a kind of tyranny because the real power in scripture comes only when we become powerless. If you keep going down this path of thinking you can fix yourself, there's no hope for you scripturally. What are you fixing? What's your objective? But if you accept that you're like an unwed mother or like a helpless child, then there's hope, but it's not in you and what you can do to fix yourself or what your therapist can tell you to fix you and, 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 and. The hope then comes from your obedience to the instruction that was written before you were born and will still be written after you are gone. Our hope must always be in the Lord, his instruction. That's what's really striking about this. So you even have to contextualize our intellectual tics <laughs> correctly, all of it is driving us towards this point that there is no hope for the sheep outside the voice of the shepherd. And so Mary is vulnerable, but not really. Jesus is vulnerable, but not really. Because the Torah is written. The Torah is written and it brought the nations to Zion. Remember too that Mary is a metaphor for Zion. So she's here in the story because the kings are gathered at Zion. Again, I always mention Psalm 2 because it says everything about the entire Bible in just a few short verses. That all of the kings of the earth are bullies, but the Lord is a much more powerful bully. And he laughs at them. And when he puts his anointed on Zion, all of them will have to bow down and worship him. So here Mary in the sense is the Mount Zion. But does that mean that the story is about Zion? No, definitely not. No, and we have to work against our assumption that everyone just knows that Zion is this big, powerful place and it's just self-evident that this is strong and powerful. This is the devil speaking because the devil speaks with this kind of universal power in this way. Just imagine, you know, these people are coming from the East. The East is, you know, Mesopotamia or Persia or whatever, it doesn't say, but it's an older civilization than Rome. It's got its own languages, its own wisdom, its own might, its own power, that they would travel from this seat of strength and might to come to this little provincial area. Is the president of the United States going to go to bow down to the new president of the Dominican Republic? I don't think so. Judah is a small piece of land. It's not particularly powerful. And you have the capital, Jerusalem, which for the people in the land, it's a very important city. But how important is Jerusalem to the people in Mesopotamia? Not particularly. And they don't even go to Jerusalem. They go to Bethlehem, which is an even smaller town on the outskirts of Jerusalem. So the king in the Dominican Republic that they're going to worship isn't even in the capital. It's out in the country. It doesn't make any sense when you think about the global scene here. Judah is not significant. Jerusalem is not significant. And Bethlehem, for sure, is not significant. The fact that they're coming all the way from the east, giving up these fantastic gifts that you would only give to a powerful king who's a baby with no father in the room in Nowheresville. And in Matthew, the gospel that moves mountains, now I can't wait to get to the end of Matthew, you have Mary, who is a metaphor for Zion, who's in Bethlehem. 
which means that the Lord can move anything anywhere. He has full control. He doesn't need Zion. Zion is wherever he sends his son. You triggered that thought in my mind when you mentioned Bethlehem. That's right, they're not in Jerusalem, they're in Bethlehem. That's the point Matthew is making. And later, when he sends them into Galilee to meet them on the mountain, he's moving the mountain as he promised you could do if you trust in the instruction. Why would trusting in the instruction allow you to move the mountain of Sinai into Galilee? Because we're not talking about mountains, just like we're not talking about Mary as the literal mother of Jesus per se. We're talking about the instruction, its mobility, its dominion, its power, its hegemony over Herod, over Caesar, over David, over Mary, over everyone in the story and everyone hearing the story. It's Bethlehem, just like I've been saying, to emphasize that it is not Jerusalem. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. And of course, any time we hear about a dream, we think of Joseph, we think of Egypt, we think of the dreamer of dreams and the interpretation of dreams. And Matthew is in fact setting us up for another favorite place of mine, the land of Egypt. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you. For that. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.